We want to thank our sponsor, Berkeley Viratronic Systems. BVS is a 52-year-old engineering company providing wireless test, security, safety, and cybersecurity solutions to government, law enforcement, correctional, telecom, and many other sectors. From hidden air tags to card skimmers, BVS identifies and locates wireless threats all around us. Learn more at bvsystems.com. My guest today, Wes Kusmal, was the sole founder in 1981 of Delphi Internet Services Corporation, the company that popularized the internet and was the creator of the world's first online encyclopedia. In 1986, while CEO of Delphi, Wes launched a spin-off, Global Villages Incorporated, to serve magazine publishers and business clients with their own private label social networks. Wes's book, entitled Quiet Enjoyment, published in 2004, with a second edition in 2014, was followed by Wes's other titles, including Don't Get Nortelled and Escape the Planetation. Wes, welcome to the show. Look forward to chatting with you. I'm very curious. What keeps you up at night? What is your cyber fear? Well, you know, Scott, the thing that keeps me up at night was articulated uh, by a company named Tanium. Um, in full page ads in the Wall Street Journal last year. Among the thousands of security technology companies, they're the ones who came out and said in these full page ads, security isn't working. We're spending $160 billion a year on security technology and things are getting worse. Um, and since then, that was just a year and a half ago. Um, and since then, it's grown to pretty close to 200 billion a year. Um, so if you ask what's, what keeps me up at night, it's knowing that. And also knowing the fact that there is a solution hiding in plain, that's been hiding in plain sight for years. Um, and it needs to be deployed. But how do you get from you know, the, the mindset of, uh, you know, that which doesn't work to that which does. I compare it to bloodletting in the middle of the mm -hmm. 19th century. You know, every, every physician in that, well, for centuries leading up to that, um, had been trained on the right amount of blood to drain from uh, which patient suffering from which disease at what uh, pro state of progression of the disease until a French um, originator of st statistical analysis, a French physician, um, discovered that bloodletting doesn't work for the most part, for almost in entirely doesn't work with some very small exceptions. So we're the, that's where we are with uh, security technology. We've gone on from the wrong track and the set of assumptions on which most security technology is built is fundamentally flawed. I, I concur. I, I think about just the amount of money that's spent each year globally, and, and it feels like uh, patchwork, you know, where they're, they're putting their fingers in the dam, but it's not solving the problem. And it, again, it gets worse and the costs go up and up and up. I feel no safer, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers feel the same way. Now, now Wes, uh, I grew up, my background, maybe somewhat similar to yours. I spent a lot of time on computers, on the internet. I loved it. Uh, I was glued to it right when it came out. My, my background is, you know, growing up programming on the Apple II and the Atari and programming and hacking, pirating games. I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, just, just fascinated with that time. In fact, my my background, my father worked at Atari um, in New York City, he was the vice president of the labs there doing engineering and developing things. So as a kid, I was just surrounded by that stuff. It was fascinating. Um, I, I want to learn a little bit more, maybe, about some of the, the stuff that you talked about there. I read in your bio there about the first online encyclopedia. That really caught my eye and wanted to learn more about that and the early days of the Internet and some of the great stuff that you were doing. Sure. Well, the uh, encyclopedia... Um as as I mentioned, was was developed in 1980 and 81. I started working on it in 80, um, and uh, 
wrote the uh, original software to drive the encyclopedia database. We called it TextRieve, um, and um, it didn't work well. Uh, but fortunately, we were um, right across town from MIT, and I had friends over there who helped me out. One by the name, particularly by the name of Phil McNeil, um, came up with a uh, a really brilliant system um, that you know was was code light. It was, there wasn't that much to the algorithm. Basically, it was a system of naming encyclopedia articles uh, and then just using the uh, Vax VMS um, you know uh, print command. Print, I think it was print. You know, just display this. Display this mm -hmm. file. Uh, wow. Anyway, um, that that worked out pretty well. Uh, the software worked well. The business model was terrible uh, mm -hmm. because we provided the computer and software and training, the whole works, presented it as an encyclopedia, and uh, uh, it turned out that the support of all that was just way beyond our resources and, and was just costly. So we stopped supplying the computer. Um, we kept the encyclopedia database and uh, pretty quickly started adding social features to it. And uh, you know, presto, it became social media before the word social media existed. Mm -hmm. Um, and that we renamed it Delphi in uh, 1982, um, and it turned out to be sustainable and uh, made up, in fact, made up the losses that we had suffered with uh, when we were trying to be in the everything business. Yeah, and that, and that was popular back then. But you really pioneered a lot of things back then, if you think about it. And, and you also wrote some books, Wes. I thought that that was interesting. One title that kind of I guess caught my eye was "Don't Get Nortelled," and and I think thinking about Nortel Networks, it was actually a a large customer of ours when we developed a lot of the wireless test tools used to build out the wireless networks that are used around the globe. Uh, but, but they went through a lot of challenges that I think a lot of people realize, and certainly the dot com bubble back in two thousand, and and uh, some of the things there you share with us even in your book there about stolen passwords. Help us understand a little bit about that book. Nortel, what a story. <laughs> what a story. So Nortel, a networking technology company, um, had everything at the same level in their company network. Uh, there was no segmentation. Um, you know, no um, uh, reasonable access controls. So a Chinese company, um, the, the one that's been in the sights of uh, the U.S. government and quite a few other governments recently, or not so recently, for, for a decade now, um, basically helped themselves to their technology, their drawings, their um, customer lists, their product plans. Basically, they stole the whole company, wow. downloaded the company. And Nortel, which people don't realize, Nortel was at the time the apple of its day. Mm -hmm. Was one of the most had one of the most highest market caps, had high, highest valuations in the world, hundreds of billions of dollars um, worth, and it vanished. Not just to, it didn't just go into Chapter Eleven. It went into, I guess, the Canadian equivalent of Chapter Seven. In other words, yeah. <laughs> liquidation, all done, close up wow. shop. Um, it. A lot of people have suggested that it was mismanagement, um, but the mismanagement came after the theft of the company. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was a result it, of it, I guess. It was a breach that cost hundreds of billions of dollars. So when we talk about Target and Equifax and some of the more recent ones, you know, they're they're chump change compared to mm -hmm. Nortel. Yeah. Yeah, that, that that really is kind of a landmark one that, that a lot of people don't realize. But when you look back, sometimes the history of companies like Nortel Networks and what they went through, it really helps you understand the bigger picture of things and why, in a sense, things are still broken and, and haven't been really fixed and what, what different uh, countries such as China and others are really doing. It's a mess. Well, out our there. security technology is built on the assumption that it's possible 
to determine the, the intentions and character of the sender of a stream of bits. You think that's possible? I don't. No. It's like asking the lobby receptionist in your office building to determine the intentions and character of everybody who walks through the door. Identify the bad guys. It does. It's not going to work. Instead, there is a solution. There is a solution that works quite well in the physical world. In that solution, we ask our lobby receptionist to get some ID. Mm -hmm. issue a visitor badge or make sure that people walking through the door who go past the reception desk are wearing an employee ID. It's about accountability, real security. We've known for hundreds of years that real security in the physical world is about accountability. It's mm -hmm. not about catching bad guys. It's, it's about, you know, having your identity attached to your actions. So if something now, we do have people in the basement of, our, of that uh, office building watching a monitor that uh, watching a monitor of the uh, entrances of the building looking for anomalies. And that's a minor part of security. Um, but, you know, it's it's nowhere near as important as accountability. Now, with zero trust, we sort of we're sort of hinting at accountability. But the, the word says it all. Zero trust. Okay. Yeah. In other words, don't trust. Don't trust. Don't trust that user automatically. But then what? Okay. <laughs> then you need, solve the problem. Of, <laughs> now you need to find a basis of trust. Either that or pull the plug go on the server because you can't trust. Right? Yeah. So, it, you know, you, what you need is measurable trust. Measurable, reliable of identity. Reliability of identities. Yeah. And that's what we are working on. Yeah, well, well said. Hey, Wes, you also worked on another book, that, that interesting title, Escape the Plantation, talking about, I guess, our digital age and privacy, which I think has really become a hot topic and, and or the lack of privacy that we hear about all the time with everybody spying on us and, and following our every move on the Internet. Tell us a little bit about that publication. Okay, well, the first thing I have to address is the title, because it alarms some people. And uh, I, I have a page uh, in the front matter of the book <clears throat> that uh, addresses that. Um, the book is about ownership of ourselves. Um, the word, there's a word for that. If someone claims ownership of you or ownership of me, there's a word for that. Um, and that is associated with the word plantation. So um, I'm not uh, I, I'm not trading on a metaphor a stretched metaphor at all. I really mean it. Silicon Valley plus the broadband and media industries claim ownership of us because in the in the digital age, information about you is you. You know, you and I are uh, encountering each other purely digitally here, um, you know, the, the bits going back and forth, you know, um, and plus, you know, you mentioned my bio and information about you, et cetera. That's, that's you, that's me. Um, so no, it's not, it's not uh, stretching a metaphor at all. It's about ownership of people. Um, Escape the Plantation advocates the same thing that the, all the all my books advocate the same thing. It is a solution that's been hiding in plain sight for years. Mm -hmm. The solutions are old, they're proven, but there's more to them than technology. And and there's been this disconnect. You know, technologists develop these um, well, in this case, PKI technologies. But the way they've been deployed is, um, well, it just hasn't had the attention of people who understand things like authority. You know, we have a necessary part of us uh, of a PKI is its certification authority. So back when this stuff was being invented, they came up with a term certification authority. Now, who is an authority? Who who 
who, what is a certification authority? And the answer seemed to be, well, anybody who is techy enough to understand how to run a certification authority server is an authority. And, you know, that's the source of the disaster. In fact, we were very close to a disaster. There was a commercial certification authority named Startcom that developed a reputation for integrity. So they had this integrity asset. Then the company put itself, and we were stockholders in this company, the company put itself up for sale. Um, and of course, with when you put a company up for sale with an outstanding asset, who does it attract? Buyers without that asset. So it attracted a buyer that lacked integrity, that whose intent was to issue fraudulent certificates, which they went and did, illustrating the fact that an authority is, can't be a sort of a, a commercial enterprise that can be bought and sold. You can't buy the vital records department of City Hall, right? It's, yeah. it's you know, regardless of the shenanigans that go on in the politics surrounding City Hall, you can't buy the authority that issues your birth certificate. And that's the source of trust. That's the kind of trust we need. It has nothing to do with technology, does it? Yeah. Right? The Vital Records Department is an institution that's lived, been around since long before digital technology. It's a source of, a, of reliable authority. So that's what, um, uh, you know, Escape the Plantation and the other books are all about. It's, a, it's about... Um, deploying PKI properly, making use of methods and procedures from that have been around for decades and centuries. That's great. Now, now Wes, where can uh, our viewers learn a little bit more about you, some of the great stuff you're doing, maybe pick up a copy of one of your books and, uh, and take a read? Well, our, um, uh, our books are for sale in um, uh, authenticity.store. Mm -hmm. authenticity uh, store they are in amazon um i want to share with you one reason why we uh, try to get people to buy them on uh, in our own store mm -hmm. um once again we're talking about personal information um Amazon and other online vendors will tell the publisher and author oh we can't share with you the name of the buyer of your book be for <laughs> privacy reasons. So is the implication that they don't invade the buyer's privacy? That's the question to ask. Of course they do. Yeah. Of course they do. They your personal information becomes a an asset, a money-making asset on their balance sheet. So when you buy a book from the authenticity store, um Yes, the author, I, get to know your identity. The publisher gets to know your identity. But that I, that information is considered your personal intellectual property, licensed to us and not to be used for any other purpose other than, you know, supporting your purchase of the book, answering your questions about its content, and, and you know, a, a legitimate publisher, reader, publisher, author, I mean, author, reader, relationship. Your personal information should be treated as, legally treated as your personal intellectual property. And we're enabling that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. And it's hard. Am Amazon kind of holds all the marbles, as they say, or chips. <laughs> it's well, we difficult. call it of Silibandia, Silicon Valley, plus yeah. the broadband and media industries. They they uh they feel they own you and me mm -hmm. and i'm laying out the ways in which you can reclaim ownership of yourself from their plantation and it's hard i, I know even as a, a fellow author I, I would say the majority of my books are definitely sold on amazon and you can go to barnes and nobles and you can buy it on my website as well um but it is harder. It is harder because it's almost like you're competing with yourself when you're competing with Amazon. And what, what you make is this much. And it, and to your point, which I think is really a valid point, they've got the IP of the buyer. We don't see as an author 
who's buying our books when they when they go on Amazon, and that's not right. We just need to step back and think. You know, think about the fact that information about ourselves is us in the digital world, and for someone to come along and claim uh, the right to our personal information. I'm sorry, that's, you know, that's the S word, you know, mm -hmm. we're on their plantation, or they think that we're on their, we are on their plantation until yeah. we take steps. And those steps are there. The way to escape the plantation is based on old technology. PKI was developed in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and old methods and procedures from the world of you know, real estate and professional licensing. Um, it's it's very well established stuff. You know, the software industry uh, tends to, there's a, an expression that uh, smart buyers use. It's called the uh, BSO, not Boston Symphony Orchestra, but bright, bright, shiny object. So it's always the new, new thing. Yeah. You know, well, no, <laughs> no. Software has been designed to solve these problems a long time ago. Um, PKI, you know, done right, will solve these problems. But works. But we got to get people to pay attention and 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 learn about how it works. And sometimes that's the biggest challenge: just educating people and having them take some time to understand what's really going on. It could be tough. But, uh, we have, a, sorry. Oh, I was, I was just going to say, I, I could probably talk to you for hours because I love this conversation. Even some of the, the research and writing I've done was uh, for one of my books was on, on, on a digital footprint, how we all create a digital footprint out there. And we don't even realize it a lot of times, but we feed into the system and give away so much about us not even realizing it and some of the downsides of that, what it could lead to, especially from a perspective of cybersecurity. It's well, not let's a... fix it. Let's fix it. No, I, I, I don't mean exactly. I, I don't mean let's, let's, let's worry about it. I mean, let's fix it. And do fix. something about it. Yeah. Solve it. And the means to solve the problem exist and they're proven. So one other uh, URL that your um, Please. Uh, audience might be interested in is Authentiverse.net. Authentiverse.net. Um, go there. We'll take you on a flight to a place called Authentiverse, where things work this way. And we'll put these links up at the bottom of the, the video podcast here for so our viewers can actually go there, make it a little bit easier for them. But Wes... Great conversation. Really appreciate your insight, all the things you've done over the decades there. And again, encourage people, take a moment, go out there and uh, pick up a copy of his books, learn a little bit more about some of the fabulous stuff that he's doing and, and make a difference there. Do something about it, as we said, not just talk about things. So thank you so much.